The CBS Sports preseason top 25 countdown continues today with our last quintet of teams prior to the top 10. Wisconsin, Oregon, Oklahoma State, USC, NC State in this package of 15 to 11. The quintet features two prominent coaching hires, Dan Lanning going from D.C. with the national champion Georgia Bulldogs to the head man at Oregon and perhaps the highest profile hire of the offseason, former Oklahoma head coach Lincoln Riley leaving the Blue Bloods for a job at USC. And that means that there are some good storylines here amongst the others as well. Paul Christ coming off the uh, two so-so seasons with Wisconsin and Oklahoma State literally within inches of a Big 12 championship last season. And the Cowboys go one better in 2022. Let's talk about all of this with CBS Sports College football writer Chip Patterson. Chip, also the host of the Cover 3 podcast, where they are going deep dives on all of this stuff. Uh, Chip, we start with Wisconsin at 15. Eight-year head coach Paul Christ hasn't been in a Big Ten title game since 2019, but they have three standout recruiting classes now in starting roles. Is there enough there for this team to compete for a Big Ten title? Without a doubt. And I expect that Wisconsin is probably going to be a popular pick to win the Big Ten West and have an opportunity. There may be a little bit of a gap between Wisconsin and Ohio State or Michigan or whoever comes out of the East, but closing that gap is really going to come down to whether we see things change on offense. You know, Paul Christ has been able to rely on good offensive lines and good running backs, and he certainly has one in Braylon Allen, but in the hire of new offensive coordinator Bobby Ingram, we are going to look to see if we see a step forward for quarterback Graham Mertz, who I think really uh, fell short of expectations last season. Wisconsin saying that they're going to open up the offense a little bit. They're not going to be as ground and pound. And Graham Mertz did have a much better performance near the end of last season than after a very, very rocky start in which he and the Badgers took losses that eliminated them from being able to compete for that division title. So Wisconsin's had got a very, very high floor thanks to the run game with Braylon Allen, thanks to a defense that has been absolutely elite under Jim Leonard. But whether or not we're gonna talk about Wisconsin, not just as a division title team, but as a potential Big 10 title team, is really gonna come down to the fact of whether or not the offense is gonna be good. Again, the defense has been elite. I expect it to be elite again under Jim Leonard, but without a more explosive offense, without a more consistent offense and quarterback play from Graham Mertz. I think the division title is the ceiling for Wisconsin. They are number 15. So number 14, we go to Dan Lanning in Oregon as he takes over, as mentioned, battle at the top of the depth chart here with Bo Nix coming in to compete with Ty Thompson. Now, how high are your expectations in year one under Dan Lanning? very high and they are tied in part to Bo Nix. I think that uh, there, there are a couple places where we've seen a quarterback line up with a former coach, Kenny Dillingham, who is the offensive coordinator at Oregon. He was on the staff at Auburn when Bo Nix was one of the best rookies in all of the SEC. So can they recapture the magic that we saw from that freshman season with Bo Nix? I think that that combination of coach and quarterback will help Nix. I also think that Nix, somebody who likes to use his athleticism, his playmaking ability, I think he will be helped by not having to try to get that done against SEC defenses. I think he will find the competition a little bit more manageable in the Pac-12 and that moving out west is going to allow him to be much more productive. And then the other thing that's going to be really, really fun is that we've got an Oregon defense that lost Kayvon Thibodeau. He was one of the most dominant pass rushers and defensive linemen in the entire sport. But what Thibodeau's spotlight has done has allowed Noah Sewell, yeah, that Sewell, to be able to grow and develop into what I think is going to be one of the best linebackers in the entire country. Noah Sewell has shown flashes of what he can do out in the field, and I think that we are going to see in 2022 Noah Sewell play at an all-American kind of level and maybe even be one of the best defenders in the country. The defense, especially under Dan Lanning's guidance, should be great, and if Bo Nix is there and is able to recapture some of that magic from his freshman season, then Oregon will be in the mix for the Pac-12 playoff and maybe even the college football playoff. All right, let's go to Oklahoma State at 13. There is some thought that Mike Gundy's team, eh, maybe they need to reload a bit, but with 7-10 win season since 2010, I mean, it's something they know how to do quickly. How do they stack up here in the Big 12? They're going to be a Big 12 title contender without a doubt. 
The question of whether they're going to be able to convert on that is going to be what we get out of Spencer Sanders, because Spencer Sanders, especially in big games, has had the knack of turning the ball over. He has got to tighten that up, and he has got to tighten that up because there's going to be more responsibility on this Oklahoma State offense. Oklahoma State was able to make it to the New Year's Six last year, was able to come within inches of winning the Big 12 thanks to the defense, and that defense loses defensive coordinator Jim Knowles. That defense loses a ton of starters on that side of the ball and it's interesting because we think about Mike Gundy and we think about all the explosive offenses that he's had during his long tenure with Oklahoma State but the reason why Oklahoma State has been successful recently has been their ability to lock folks down on defense and so as I look at all the turnover on the defensive side that means it's much more on Spencer Sanders who in yet another year of working with Gundy what will coach and quarterback what will that offense be able to do because last year they were able to win games scoring in the 20s, low 30s. Now I think that we're going to have to look at an Oklahoma State team that is going to have to score in the 30s or maybe even the 40s to be able to win and compete for a Big 12 title. Is Oklahoma State ready to do that? That is going to depend on whether Spencer Sanders can avoid the turnover. Yeah, can they go one better? Of course, tying that school record for wins last season with a dozen. Speaking of a dozen, number 12 is where we go next. USC, I mean, really just two words needed here. Lincoln Riley. I mean, Chip, Wednesday we spoke to Tom about Mario Cristobal at Miami and the thought was long-term gain and perhaps a little bit of short-term pain. Can the same be said here or is this USC team still laying the foundation? Now the ceiling is high because of a band of mercenaries that is gathered together in Los Angeles with a story that honestly is fit for Hollywood. You know, you go and you get the best quarterback from Oklahoma. You get the best running back from Oregon. You get the best wide receiver from Colorado. You get the best wide receiver in the country in Jordan Addison from Pittsburgh. Uh, Throw in Eric Gentry from Arizona State. These are instant impact additions, some of them in their final year of college eligibility. Uh, This is going to be a one-time throw it all together Can they gel and make this happen? On paper, USC wins the Pac-12, competes for a college football playoff in year one, but this is not decided on paper. These are human beings, and that is an immense challenge for Lincoln Riley to get all these transfers to pull together. But again, Caleb Williams with what we saw, flashes of what he did at Oklahoma. He's even got Mario Williams, another uh, former Oklahoma wide receiver out there. Travis Dye, Jordan Addison. The offense should be massive and explosive, hard to deal with all up and down the schedule. But can you get all the pieces in place in a short time? USC could hit the ground running and exceed expectations in year one. But then there's also the human potential of this. If all the transfers cannot gel together immediately, then there is going to be some short-term pain before what I agree is going to be long-term gain with Lincoln Riley. Chip, how loud are the boos going to be all season long with this team bolting for the Big Ten? I mean, we're talking about Pac-12 fans, right? I mean, I'm not trying to shoot. Like, how 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 loud are the boos going to be at Stanford? I don't know. How many people are at the game? Like, how loud are the boos going to be in some of these stadiums? <laughs> we'll see. I do think that USC and UCLA absolutely are going to be playing the villain card, but I don't see that carrying... Uh, so much weight that they're going to find any more of a home field disadvantage than they would not already have. You look at the schedule right here, October 15th is one of the biggest games in the Pac-12 schedule when USC goes to Utah. You don't need conference realignment narratives or storylines for the must there in Salt Lake City to be fired up for the arrival of USC. USC and Utah are going to be at the very top of the competition to win this thing. And remember, they are not going to be deciding the Pac-12 championship game by divisions. It will be the top two teams regardless of divisions. So we will see USC play at Utah on October 15th. Jeremy, you get asked me to pick that game now. I'm taking Utah. But if they were to meet again for a second time, after USC has had a little bit more time for those transfers to get to know to each other, they could be a much more dangerous team at the end of the season than they are in that big-time game against the Utes. Well, of course, that's the big question, right? How well are they going to be gelled by that time, by the time they play uh, that big game? That is a wait and see. All right, number 11, NC State. Well, results may not match expectations, uh, the likes of USC and Oregon in terms of that. The same cannot be said for NC State. This is a team, Chip. They're ready to win now. Devin Leary had 35 touchdowns, five interceptions. 
3,500 passing yards, and it seems like he's flying below the radar in the national conversation. He's not doing it locally. He was named the preseason player of the year in the ACC, beating out the likes of a Tyler Van Dyke at Miami, of a Sam Hartman at Wake Forest, or even a DJ Uyunglele at Clemson. But I do think that he is going to be somebody that we start to look at as one of the best quarterbacks in all of college football. He does a great job on third down. He does a great job in the red zone. He avoids the mistakes. And I think that he is going to be the key to NC State being able to take the next step on offense. He has to carry an NC State offense that lost a lot of players at the skill position. But the good thing for Devin Leary in terms of NC State and their overall path to success is this defense is going to be nasty. They performed at a top 20 level about a year ago, but they took multiple injuries at key positions and their next man up mentality. They were ready to address that the Wolfpack defense and Devin Leary at quarterback are going to be able to help NC State win some of those key toss-up games on the schedule. The non-conference schedule is cushy, and I think that that sets up for NC State to be undefeated when NC State goes into Death Valley to play Clemson wow. after beating the Tigers in Raleigh a year ago in one of the biggest games in the ACC schedule. If NC State beats Clemson for a second year in a row, now they move into the driver's seat in the conference and things get really intense around Raleigh. Nine and three last year, looking at double digit wins possibly this year. He is CBS Sports College football writer Chip Patterson taking us all the way down to the top 10 of our CBS Sports preseason college football rankings. Thanks very much, Chip. We started at 25. Uh, that is where Pittsburgh sits. Of course, a number of changes. Kenny Pickett not there anymore, so we're going to be interested to see how Pittsburgh fares. Then you have Tennessee, Kentucky, Houston, and Wake Forest. Demon Deacons, a loss to Pittsburgh, of course, in the ACC title game last season. The other five started with Michigan State at 20. Of course, we talked about Tom Fornelli in Miami. Very excited about what's going to happen in Miami, possibly. Lots of uh, potential there for Mario Cristobal in his first year. The turnover chain is gone. We're going to see what happens with Miami. Uh, Penn State under James Franklin. What can they do? Cincinnati, I mean, they were a college football playoff team last year. Uh, but we don't know if they're going to be one this year. Lots of changes there. And then, of course, going down from 15, 16 to 15 to 11. Uh, those teams that we just talked about with Chip Patterson as we approach the top 10. For more on the list, all 131 teams are ranked, by the way. You can see that over on CBSports.com. But for more in-depth coverage on the list, you can join Chip and Tom on the Cover 3 podcast. Download and follow wherever you get your preferred podcast audio. Do you want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game? The highlights, the picks, the instant analysis, no yelling, no fake debates, no politics. Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.